little, I wanted to be an archaeologist. And this is me, age three, about to embark on my first excavation. Um, and I became an archaeologist. But, and please excuse the pun, there will be plenty of those in my talk, I didn't think there was any future in it. And so, uh, to avoid my career being in ruins, I decided to specialize. And so I went back to university, and I did a master's degree, and then a PhD in computer science. Now, archaeology is the study of human activity through the objects and the architecture of the past, whereas computer science is the creation of new technologies. It's about the present, and it's about the future. So you don't think they have a lot in common, but actually what interests me is the intersection of these things, the changes that we see through time when new technologies are introduced to our societies. For the past 10 years, I've been working in human-computer interaction and artificial intelligence at Goldsmiths University of London. Lately, I've been working on sex robots. My parents are so proud of me. <laughs> um, so, it's quite niche. And when I say sex robots, it's really a shorthand for all kinds of technology that relates to intimacy. So it covers topics like psychology, philosophy, interactivity, attachment, our hopes, our fears, and love. It's about forming intimate relationships with machines and with artificial intelligence. Now, sex and artificial intelligence might sound like a strange mix, but they have some things in common. Sex is central to being human. It's how we all got here. It's a fundamental motivation of humans to pass on their DNA. This maps really nicely to traditional ideas about artificial intelligence, where people were trying to program machines that had goal-oriented behavior. But there's another side to it, too. There's a branch of cognitive science that looks at embodiment, how we use our physical bodies to explore the world and make sense of it well, you don't get much more embodied than sex. Now, for the purposes of my research, I'm defining sex as any type of enacted sexual behavior. So it's sexual activity that releases the chemicals that make us feel good, the oxytocin, serotonin, the endorphins. It's about pleasure. It doesn't necessarily involve penetration. It doesn't necessarily mean reaching orgasm. It's not heteronormative. And it's not just penis meet vagina. So anything goes. Now, the robot in sex robots. Robots are embodied. They have a physical place in the world. And some of them have artificial intelligence in them. A robot is simply a machine that can automate certain actions. And we already have them around us. We have domestic robots in our homes, like robot vacuum cleaners. They work on factory production lines. They, there are care robots, there are robots carrying out surgery in hospitals to a higher standard than a human can. And we have robots that we use for companionship as well. Now the thing about robots today is that none of the robots that we have are sentient. None of them are conscious, none of them are self-aware. That's a really long time off if it happens at all. There are big arguments in the field of artificial intelligence about whether that will happen. So what about these sex robots then? Well, I see them as a form of sex technology, and you may be familiar with sex technology. You may be intimately familiar with sex technology. Um, I'm not taking a poll. Um, it could be things like sex hardware, sex tech hardware, which is sex toys, um, the sort you can you know, buy on the high street. It might be uh, sex tech software, which are things like apps, perhaps hookup apps, apps for intimacy to explore desires. It could be content like virtual reality, which now has a lot of porn as content. And I think sex robots fits under that. You might recognize some of these shapes. <laughs> now, we know that phallic objects that look a lot like sex toys were being created 30,000 years ago. 30,000. These are actually only from 12,000 years ago. Um, now, they may not have had a sexual purpose, and academics and archaeologists will argue a lot about this, but I'm saying don't overlook the obvious here, okay? Um, 
academia tends to be a bit squeamish when it comes to talking about sex. We see these shapes right the way through time, resulting in the sort of sex toys we have today, like vibrators. The aesthetic of current sex toys is really changing, though, because we have the potential of new forms of interaction that's sort of unlimited by physical realism. And so we're seeing sex toys that are breaking new boundaries. They've become beautiful. They've become customizable, programmable. There are sex toys today that wouldn't look out of place on a shelf in your living room. Honestly, you wouldn't tell the difference. I have lots in my office and people hardly notice. So how long have sex robots been around? Well, actually, we can trace it way, way back, back to the earliest written history. Pandora, known for her box, was the first human woman <laughs> in Greek myth. Um, she was created by the gods. They made her, and they gave her an artificial intelligence. She was known as the beautiful evil. She was condemned for her sexuality. And actually, that's a trope that we see playing throughout time. We see it down the years, this idea of the seductive artificial lover who's very eroticized, female, shapely, obedient, just a little edge of danger. These gynoids, which is the term for a female humanoid robot, they're designed to play to cultural stereotypes. And we see it in sci-fi books, we see it in films like Maria in Metropolis, Ava in Ex Machina. It's far, far less common to see a sex robot in male form. Now, there's a number of reasons for this. It might be socialized bias in that there weren't that many women authors or filmmakers before this. It may be that there are fewer women in tech. That's a big problem. We know that the people who make the tech shape the form of the tech. It may be because there's been a massive issue in that their women's sexuality has been disregarded for centuries. What I want to explore is how can we create sex technology that is diverse, fair, equal, and unbiased? If you want to buy a sex robot today, this is what you get. There aren't really any in existence. What we have are mechanized sex dolls and companies that are promising to put artificial intelligence into those dolls. They are posable, silicone, woman-shaped objects. They're pretty much like a bad shop mannequin from the 1980s. So who buys them? Well, the US company that manufactures this particular doll says they're bought by people who are lonely and isolated. They call them love dolls rather than sex dolls. They say that they're bought by therapists and psychiatrists, by families for adult children who are socially excluded. Now, we know from years of study that humans get attached to non-living things. There's a particular effect known as the Tamagotchi effect after those little virtual pets that people had in the mid-90s. Some people tried to kill those pets deliberately. Uh, <laughs> but people get attached to them. And we see it in studies about care and companion robots in nursing homes. We see it with our digital assistants in the homes, Siri, Cortana, Alexa. We see people arguing with their GPS systems. There are actually anecdotes of soldiers in battle who have funerals for their bomb disposal robots when they're damaged beyond repair. We also know that human-like robots can really freak us out, okay? So this is a thing called the uncanny valley. And it's basically that the more lifelike something looks, the wider the gulf gets, the more we're creeped out by it until it crosses that boundary into being indistinguishable from us. Now, there are some theories about why that might be, and it might be because something that seems, looks human, looks alive, but isn't alive, makes us think of death. So we're a long way off. We're a long way off from closing that gap and from crossing the uncanny valley. We're a long way from the TV shows of Westworld or humans. So I want to think about what other forms that sex robots could take. What's the point in pursuing this human angle? What about all the technology we have that allows us to explore things? What about different textures, different shapes, different movements? These days, we've got smart fabrics, we've got e-textiles that respond to touch, so we could make a cuddly robot. We can make a sensual one that can be stroked and can stroke us back. A lot of us are wearing technology that can track our bodies. 
things like health trackers that can measure our heartbeat or our skin responses. You can buy off-the-shelf equipment that reads your brainwaves. What if we took that data that we get from those trackers and we fed it into some form of sex technology so that we had something very individual that would respond to our needs? Can we abstract these sex robots the way we abstract sex toys? And can we make something that's really beautiful and malleable and unique? So what are the benefits? Because I don't think it's just this dystopian vision of a solitary man addicted to his robot girlfriend. We know that sex has a really wide range of well-being measures associated with it. Now, not everyone wants to have sex, but there are people who do and who aren't able to. There are sexual surrogates who are people working with clients and sex therapists who will engage with these clients sexually to work on physiological and psychological issues that the clients have. Perhaps that's a place where our technology could be applied. There's a sex tech company in the UK. They make what they term a guybrader, and it's a sex toy that allows men with spinal cord injuries to reach orgasm. It can also be used for erectile dysfunction. And the really nice thing about that tech is that it can be used by anyone. And this is a great thing about accessible technology. If you make your technology accessible, everybody in society can benefit from it. We've got an aging population in the developed world. The English longitudinal study of aging has shown that people are having sex in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. And yet we have a care crisis and people end up going into care homes and nursing homes where sex becomes way down the list of priorities in their life. But maybe they want that. Maybe we can provide technology that lets them have an active sex life. Sex robots could be used therapeutically to treat sex offenders. There's been a study at the University of Montreal to use virtual reality to rehabilitate, rehabilitate sex offenders. But before you think I'm too naive and optimistic, I do recognize there are problems around this. It's not uncomplicated. We might go out with a bang. <laughs> These are headlines that arose from a conference I organized in December around love and sex with robots, um, which the media loved. Um, I think that's a little bit too negative. But there are, there are issues. One of my big concerns is around data. So a lot of smart technology collects data. And it's massive, massive amounts of personal information that's being taken and stored and hopefully is safe. But you never know what happens if there's a data breach. Who's got your data? Who owns it? There's already been a lawsuit in the US around data collected from a smart vibrator. There are other legal and ethical ramifications. What happens if we try to treat sex offenders with sex robots, and instead of it being a proxy, it becomes an escalation to further abuse. There needs to be a lot more work in this. Now, a big question that people ask, will humans become redundant? I don't think they will. It's a normal fear that we see repeated throughout time. When the printing press was developed, we were told that books would be a threat due to the sheer amount of information that people would be exposed to. Newspapers were going to lead to complete social isolation. The television was going to destroy family life. We treat new technology with wariness because of the unknown. But I have a degree of optimism. We're living in a technological age. We can't avoid it. We're human in a world that's increasingly full of machines. Artificial intelligence is integrating seamlessly into our lives, so seamlessly that we don't even notice it. Perhaps our robotic counterparts are the key to happiness if we shape them in the right way. Maybe it's time to literally embrace the robots. Thank you.